Okay, so um, Scala 3 is coming for real now. Um, and I'm going to give you uh, a, a quick introduction what it is. I can't be, uh, and, and then I'm going to go into one particular thing in depth. So the current status is that uh, we are about to release the first release candidate of uh, Scala 3. Uh, that's uh, in next week. So next week we have release, release candidate one, which means that uh, that release contains the final language and the APIs of Scala 3. We want you to kick the tires, try it out, uh, put it to the test. We'll fix anything that falls off, but otherwise this is it. So basically from now on, we will fix bugs that, uh, that you notice or that we notice and uh, with the aim of essentially having something as quickly as possible, it could be a matter of weeks, uh, that we can release as the final version. Uh, when we are able to do that is basically when we get no more critical bugs from you, then we decide we are ready to do that. So um, what uh, the, I want to do now in this talk is uh, to pass it over to you, the uh, community, the audience, uh, what does the community think of the new language? What are your expectations and concerns? We actually ran a survey about this and I am going to relate to you the results of that survey. So what comes next is sort of what the community thinks of what will come, uh, their hopes, expectations, concerns. So first, uh, that's a graph with the timestamps. So we, uh, uh, the Scala Center invited a th survey uh, on 13th of uh, December and then essentially responses came in uh, as a flood initially and then ever since then as a trickle. Overall, we got 578 answers, including a total of 413 comments uh, across five comment sections. So we'll, uh, I'm gonna show you a little bit what the answers and comments were. So the first one was uh, features. Question was, how excited are you about the upcoming Scala 3 language features? And uh, oops, sorry. The, um, uh, the ranking here is essentially in uh, uh, blue is excited, red is neutral, uh, yellow is not excited and green is unanswered. So uh, most excitement uh, gets um, is uh, sp uh, sp spawned by enums, interesting enough. So enums seem to be much anticipated. That's great. I, I really like enums. Um, uh, they are a nice addition to, uh, to Scala because they allow you to essentially write uh, both Java enumerations and uh, abstract data types in a very concise fashion. So. Uh, that certainly should make a lot of programs simpler and shorter. Uh, number two, what, which was uh, actually a surprise uh, to me because uh, if you look at Twitter say, then uh, they don't seem to be very much uh, in, the, in the spotlight. Number two were union and intersection types. Most people are excited about them. Uh, so intersection types are actually not that new. They're mostly what we already had with width just cleaned up uh, so that they now have nice algebraic laws that you can build on. And, uh, but union types, that, which are the duals of intersections, they are new. So uh, it's interesting that they get so, such a warm reception. Union types, I anticipate, are, will be really useful for interop with uh, other languages, notably in, in, in JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript has a lot of union types. Uh, so uh, having them in Scala will help understand the environment there. And also in some high performance code where essentially you want to have unions without having to have a wrapper type, without having to box. Number three is extension methods. Uh, that's also uh, something that I, I anticipate uh, will be really hugely important. I would actually have put extension methods at number one because from, from essentially the, the, use, the, the use profile that I have now, they somehow seem to crop up everywhere. So extension methods are warmly received and I believe really important. Number four is something rather heavyweight, that's type class derivation. So think uh, shapeless or Scala Z deriving or things like that. So what type class derivation gives you is we have put that in a very simple package in the language. 
So the package is very simple to use. You just uh, uh, write a class and then you write extends some super classes and then you can also write derives and then comes some type classes that it derives. And that's all you ha ever have to do and you get the behavior of the type classes that way. Of course, there's some work to be done by the type class providers. People who write the type classes to essentially make them presentable to this framework. And that's essentially where the hard parts are. But uh, the uh, expectation is that uh, you will essentially only have a few uh, designers of those library type classes. And they have to know their stuff, of course, and they might essentially have to uh, suffer a little bit to, to get it right. Uh, but then everybody can use that, make, make use of that. So that should be great. Number five is opaque type aliases. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So I'm going to skip it here. So it's also interesting that this is so high up the list. Number six is explicit nouns. So explicit nouns, I should actually say that's still sort of in trial state. Um, we haven't, uh, it's uh, under a Y option, minus Y explicit nouns in the compiler right now. And uh, uh, essentially, we are tipping our toes in the water here uh, to see uh, how it goes. Um, but I expect it will be fully integrated over the time of uh, essentially the 3, 3, 1, 3, 2 release, I guess. So right now you get it under a Y option and in the future, it, I hope it will be the standard. Number seven is something that I actually also care a lot about, maybe even more than extension methods. That's essentially cleanup of implicits given and using. Uh, then we have top level definitions. That's really uh, nice because it lets you write very simple programs without the boilerplate and it sort of blurs the distinction between scripts and full programs. Number nine is again something pretty heavyweight that's match types, which let's give you essentially full-blown type level computation without the use of uh, complicated implicits. Think age lists. Uh, yeah, you, in, instead of age lists, you can get essentially do the same computations with tuples directly. No implicits are needed. Uh, the uh, number uh, I forgot to count, probably 10, is another heavy type, um, uh, type level uh, construct polymorphic function types. No, sorry, it's not pipe type level, it's value level, but it's heavyweight or it's, it's very powerful in the sense that now you can have function types of polymorphic functions. So not just A to B, but for all A, uh, A to B, something like that. Multiversal equality is a safety feature that essentially makes equality more picky, that you can't compare things which are nonsensical with each other. Um, New macros, that's essentially a huge uh, change. The old macro system has been replaced uh, uh, wholesale. There's nothing left of it. And uh, what we have is a set of new abstractions based on inline, quote, and splice, uh, which have much, much better foundations and are much safer than uh, the previous uh, macros that we had before. Uh, kind polymorphism, and now it gets really esoteric. Um, dependent function types, inline, optional braces, um, context functions, uh, programmatic structural types. So that's sort of the long tail, export classes, main methods. So you don't need to write uh, an app object anymore. It, uh, you can just write a main method directly as a top level method, and that will be your program. And creator applications came last. So that's the thing that let you drop the new. So that was essentially the initial expectation. So for, of course, we expect that to change as people get more experience with these features. So uh, one uh, very controversial thing, of course, what is optional braces. Uh, so there was an answer, how excited are, are you about optional braces? So the excited um, is in the majority, but not the absolute majority. So it's 40% excited, 28% not excited, and 28% neutral. Uh, so I guess uh, the neutral people are sitting on the fence and wait how it's going to work out, which is a very sensible uh, attitude to take right now. Uh, almost everybody has an opinion, only 2% didn't answer that. 
so I personally have very high hope uh, that we essentially get a modern syntax that doesn't use uh, extraneous lexical tokens like, like these braces, but we'll see how it works out. And in any case, uh, as the title says, it's optional braces. So braces can be left out in many situations. Uh, but uh, of course, if you don't like them, you can still continue to write them and we'll be able to do so uh, for forever. Okay, so uh, if we look at the comments, uh, then uh, that's of course, uh, so that's people who actually wrote something and just didn't click a box. So then you see that most of the comments actually go to uh, syntax where uh, there are more concerns. Well, you would expect comments to be mostly concerns and rather than praise because you would assume that uh, essentially uh, if people are happy, then they don't need to write about it. But if they have concerns, they will. So. Uh, Syntax is mostly concern and request and very active in this thing. Uh, general is mostly praise. Uh, and then we had several uh, concerns and praises in both, both sides for opaque types. And then we have a long tail for the rest. So then we talked, we asked about tooling. Uh, so how important is it for you uh, that the uh, Scala 3 supports, uh, the, uh, the, that the following tools support Scala 3. So that was interesting. Uh, top of the rank is actually SPT. Uh, so we chose that SPT uh, is still quite the dominant uh, build framework in Scala land. And uh, the, the good news is SPT already supports Scala 3. So that's fine. Uh, second was IntelliJ, and uh, I believe IntelliJ also is very close to supporting full Scala 3. So that was number two. Uh, number three, Scala format. Number four, VS Code, which supports Scala 3 with uh, metals. Um, number five, Scala fix. Uh, then comes Scala JS, uh, Scala 3 doc, which exists. Uh, S coverage, Ammonite, that's in the works. Uh, Scala native, not yet, but hopefully soon. And then uh, Scala style, other LSP editors. Mill has a Scala 3 plugin. Um, Water remover, Maven, Gradle, MDoc, and uh, Basil as the last. So this shows, I guess, mostly uh, how how, much, how how big the intersection is between people who are interested in Scala 3 and therefore responded to the survey and people who use the tool in question. Because of course, if you use the tool in question and want to move to Scala 3, then that's important for you. So uh, for the migration, we asked, well, what is uh, what are your concerns with migration? Since Scala 3 is such a big release, of course, that, that is going to be a big concern for many, but where exactly are the concerns? So uh, there we saw that the top concern is actually lack of support in libraries. Uh, so that means that uh, the top concerns is not so much the language or the tooling, but essentially before you can move, all the other libraries have to move. Uh, or, well, actually the, the, the situation is not quite as bad as that because it turns out that uh, Scala 3 always can uh, always supports uh, 2.13 libraries. So Scala 3 can uh, access 2.13 libraries. Uh, that with one caveat, it cannot make sense of 2.13 macros. So if you uh, want to use a library that has macros, then that library, uh, that those macros will have to be uh, ported for Scala 3. Uh, the good news is that there are actually already quite a lot of libraries, I think uh, close to 200 different libraries that are ported to Scala 3. We have a, a community built that, I, I, that essentially con combines common libraries and that we test nightly on Scala 3. And that I think approaches one and a half million lines of code, including heavyweights such as Scala test or Zio or uh, cats effects or uh, many others more. And uh, so that all runs with Scala 3. Um, uh, and uh, it's built with a number of build tools. Uh, so some of it is built with SPT, others are built with mill. You have basically the most, most of the Howie uh, uh, 
library is ported to Scala 3 and so on. So the core is there, but of course there's a long tail. There are many libraries that you might want to need to use. The hope is that in the long tails, hopefully macros are not actually that prevalent. So that means that you can already essentially port your things with 213. But definitely uh, we see that there is concern in the community for that. The second concern is runtime performance. Uh, that's fair, fair enough, I guess. Uh, so we have to essentially find out how close Scala 3 and is to Scala 2 here in the runtime performance. They have very similar bytecode generators and there are plans in the works to actually share the code generator between 2 and 3. If that's the case, then the performance should be very uh, comparable, except for one thing that, that is that Scala 3 does not support uh, full specialization yet. So specialization is the thing that if you have a, a generic class and then some of them uh, can be specialized uh, for primitive types so that you don't need to box these things. And uh, what we uh, can do is we do specialize the most important types uh, that's function types so function types are already specialized and probably very soon uh, tuple types will be specialized as well so that means that essentially everything you get from the standard library and that is specialized in Scala 2 is specialized in Scala 3 as well and then there's another challenge of for libraries such as Spire that uh, essentially draw heavily draw on specialization uh, what to do about those so the plan here is that we uh, say we will look, uh, take a close look at specialization, what we can do there, but we will not necessarily do it the same way as in Scala 2, because the way it's done in Scala 2 has also downsides. It's, uh, it's a bit fragile. It can lead to a lot of code that gets generated. So the question is maybe there, there are better ways to do that. Uh, we don't have answers to these questions yet, but uh, we will essentially we keep our elbow room to, to be able to ask the questions and find possibly new answers for them. Uh, number three is compile time performance. So there I have the impression we are more or less on a par. Uh, so some benchmarks and some benchmarks we are uh, some percentage slower and the others we are some percentage faster than Scala 2. It really depends on, on what you do and what your application profile is. But it's by and large the same, the same ballpark, which means it's that's actually pretty good because I think Scala 2, Scala 213 has improved a lot over the last years and will continue to improve a lot. And I believe Scala 3 will do the same thing. So there will be a trajectory to faster compile times. Uh, what, but I, I believe compile times now are already quite respectable. So in numbers uh, on this MacBook Pro that I have, if I compile from uh, SPT till the compile, so uh, a warm compiler, then I expect to get something like uh, three, between three and 5,000 lines a second out of that. So that means that even large projects should compile in fairly reasonable numbers. Uh, a small project of, let's say, 10,000 lines, you shouldn't even notice that with incremental compilation. And larger projects with incremental compilation, you shouldn't also notice it. But if you do a clean compile, then well, it might take 10 or 20 seconds, but that should be it. Uh, I believe Scala compile times have often been uh, uh, maligned because what most people do is they test Hello World. So they write Hello World and then they run Scala C on Hello World. So uh, what happens then is that you take, I don't know, it takes five seconds or seven seconds or whatever. And then they extrapolate and say, oh my God, this is horribly, horribly slow. That's maybe one line a second or something like that. What happens there, of course, what one has to know is that uh, all the time is spent in uh, loading the compiler, which is a big program, it's a big, uh, sophisticated program that gets has needs, needs to be loaded. And then the compiler starts running in interpreted mode. So the JVM interprets the code. That's not very fast. And then okay, little by little, it will start to actually generate actual machine code uh, to speed it up. And I guess by the time it's finished with Hello World, then maybe it has done that uh, not at all, or maybe only a tiny percentage. So you load a huge program, many, many classes, and you run it in interpreted mode. And yes, it, that's not very fast, of course. And that's essentially the downside of um, uh, essentially running on, on the JVM with a normal uh, JVM. 
uh, we should look at essentially uh, maybe a Scala native version uh, for the for the command line tool or uh, maybe generally better packaging that we don't have that. But anyway, if you run if you compile with essentially real projects uh, with real setups like incremental compilation, then it shouldn't be a concern really nowadays. Uh, the next uh, concern was compatibility between 3 and 2.13. Yes, I mean, there are uh, things that have to be bridged. So that's essentially a lot of uh, small things. Uh, but uh, the, in fact, I, what, what's interesting is that most people are not neutral or not that concerned rather than uh, being very concerned or concerned. Breaking language changes, that's about the same percentage. Then we have new macros. So I guess here the concern is mostly that the macros have to be rewritten. And yes, in my experience, that's actually the biggest expense that one usually has. So that's essentially if one ports a library that is uses macros, that's where most of the effort goes into. On the other hand, uh, the, the, the upside is that I believe the new macros are a lot more reliable uh, and uh, simpler to understand and uh, simpler to tame than than the old ones. So there is there is a uh, definitely a big gain to be had by rewriting. Uh, removed macro annotations. Uh, yes, that's also a concern. Um, they will uh, come back, but we didn't have the time to put them in three zero right now because we're about to release. Uh, what we did is basically the last thing, because before we released 3.0 uh, was that we changed the inlining around so that inlining technically will be done after typer. And that essentially gives us a technical basis to be able to support macro annotations in the future. But it's not done yet, but at least essentially we have prepared the ground so that, so that uh, we can uh, hopefully uh, put it in soon. Uh, lack of support in compiler plugins. Uh, so that's another thing that um, we, the Scala 3 has compiler plugins, but the architecture has changed and there are uh, more restrictions. So in Scala 3, a compiler plugin will have to run after typer. That means that the uh, program that the user writes and sees has to pass the parser and the typer, which means that basically that you cannot change the language anymore. Uh, compiler plugins that ran before uh, typer in the parser after parser, that they could essentially um, create new syntax, uh, allow new syntax in the language. And that essentially caused a lot of variation and um, also confusion, I would say, in the syntax. So those macros are uh, supported only in experimental mode. So that means only for nightlies, but not in stable releases. And finally, we have some missing compiler options. So if you, um, uh, that, that's, I imagine something that will come. Uh, if you miss a compiler option, then please speak, speak up and we'll see what that, whether we can put that in uh, soon. Okay, the, the other thing that was interesting was where do people get their communication from? Um, turns out blog posts on uh, scalalang.org are actually quite effective, about 50% get it from there. Uh, Twitter is quite uh, widespread, so almost 50% get it from Twitter. Uh, from the GitHub releases, uh, we have, uh, uh, is in, um, in third place. Reddit, uh, also quite a few, which uh, should, we should take to heart because I think the Scala Center and generally the Scala implementers have absolutely zero presence on Reddit. So that's pretty, pretty self-managed. I don't actually don't know what the user, the, the, what, what, what goes on on Reddit most times. Um, announcement on contributorscalalang.org. Uh, so that's essentially the uh, uh, this, this court, discourse uh, 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 pages. That's also a quarter. So that's essentially, the uh, more for the insiders, as the title says, contributors, scalalang.org. That's where I personally I'm, hang out most of the time because uh, essentially we, we want to discuss everything we do, we discuss there. Um, uh, email newsletters, uh, Gitter, um, and then uh, announcements of, on users, scalalang.org. So there we see that's a bit neglected compared to contributors, and I guess we should change that. 
and finally this code. So um, what uh, if we break that up um, and have said, well, uh, essentially most of it is kalalam.org and Twitter um, and some GitHub releases, uh, uh, but there were also quite a few newsletters and for newsletters in particular, 60 comments identified the Scala Times newsletter as one of their sources of information about Scala. That was the most common. So, uh, so that it's great to have Scala Times. Thank you, people who run Scala Times. You do really an essential service to the community here. And then we have also others, uh, O'Reilly Learning Books, Telegram communities, Zio newsletters, Medium blogs, the SIPs, and so on. Okay, so that was your feedback. So what's my take on it? So what, what is Scala 3? What do I expect from Scala 3? So my take is that uh, with Scala 3, we've tried to come up with a language that's as clean and simple as possible, and that tames some of the power of Scala. So simple and clean, but also safer than before. Before we essentially we traded simplicity uh, for, uh, well, we're not gonna essentially, you have an unlimited space of things that you can do yourself and there might be some sharp, sharp edges and that's on you basically. Uh, they, they will, we, we, we trust you to do the right thing. And over the 15 years that Scala 2 existed, We've noted that some of these edges are sharper than others, and uh, we should uh, do something about that, that people don't continuously get cut by them. So when I say simplicity, then of course, simplicity has to be measured against power. So essentially, if you have a toy language that can't do much, or a language that doesn't have static types, or a language that doesn't really support functional programming, then you can be simpler than other languages. But a language that has all these things, uh, that it's a challenge to essentially keep that as simple as possible. And I'm not saying yet we've risen to the challenge, but we have taken up the challenge. So that's, I think, what, what we can say about that one. So if you look at simplicity, uh, then one thing that uh, I uh, have studied a while ago, I'm not exactly sure, I think the numbers have changed probably a little bit uh, since then, is grammar size in lines. And there, it's actually a big surprise that Scala is actually quite on the lower end of languages. So if you look at the lower end of languages, then, well, the lowest one is Python. That's, that's actually no surprise. Python is a very simple language. It's not functional. It doesn't have types, or at least at the time it didn't. So it doesn't it's essentially that didn't measure extensions such as uh, the, the types in Python and it, that didn't measure any of the latest addition, additions like pattern matching. So I guess with those Python would also, uh, the bar graph would go a little bit up here. The second one was Haskell, uh, but then again, it's actually not super fair because that's Haskell 98. So that's essentially the, the language that nobody uses. Uh, so what everybody uses is this language Haskell plus any sub-combination of more than 80 language extensions. So if I had added all these language extensions, then Haskell would probably be, be very high up in this bar graph. Uh, but I haven't done that because, I mean, Haskell is essentially this puzzle uh, uh, of essentially many different sub-languages that you mix and match as you want. Then comes Scala, and then comes sort of the the closest competition, Kotlin, Swift, and Java. And you notice they are all, they're all significantly larger than Scala, which is no wonder because they have all significantly more special cases about things that essentially you, you have properties and you have a special array index syntax and you have lots and lots of different things which probably people don't realize that much because they are very familiar to them. That's just what languages used to do all the time. So it sort of blends into the background, but still it's there. So these languages are definitely much bigger. And then you have the real heavyweights, where again, it's quite interesting that the biggest heavyweight is actually C-sharp and not C++. So C-sharp is much, much bigger. 
Uh, it has a lot more features than C++. C++ has the reputation to be a lot more complex. And it is in the sense that it's more dangerous. It's harder to write a correct C++ program. So the big, the big language surface of C Sharp essentially gives you many cookie cutters that you can use uh, to for essentially preconceived solutions. And in that sense, it's safer. So uh, language size is not everything, but it gives you an indication of essentially how baroque, how uh, well, how much, how, yeah, how baroque or uh, how much of a fractal your language really is. Does it have a few simple rules or does it have a lot of special cases? That's what this measures. And simplicity has to be measured against power. So uh, Scala is a very powerful language. Uh, it has a rich static type system, has full support for functional programming, and it has very advanced support for modular programming. So if you want to compose functional modules safely, you're going to need something like it. What Scala also has as a bonus is easy interoperability with Java or JS. So with all these things, of course, it is uh, quite hard to make the language small. And I believe we have worked very hard to achieve that as much as we can. But of course, there are sharp edges in Scala. Uh, everybody knows that. And uh, what we wanted to do with Scala 3 is do something about the sharp edges. So here I have a list of these sharp edges. Implicits are confusing, they're overused. Implicit conversions are particularly dangerous. Uh, then uh, people, uh, there's a joke that essentially Scala has, I, I don't know, 21 uses of the underscore. So that's confusing. It has weird data types, XML symbols. Uh, it has, some people find it a very unnatural syntax, mostly people coming from Haskell or other functional languages, they say they just can't look at that syntax, it's too weird. It has sort of arcane constructs such as early initializers. And with Scala 3, we actually managed to uh, ameliorate, to, to do something about that, to change the situation quite a bit. So instead of confusing implicits, we have given and using, which I think is a lot clearer and a lot shorter than what the implicits are. And it's quite clear what this does. Instead of the overuse of implicits, we have actually added new things for specific use cases. So implicits are this sort of amazingly powerful thing that can do everything. And that's, that's the complexity because since it can do everything, you have to sort of, uh, uh, you don't really know what it does in this particular instance. Uh, so uh, it's very unpredictable what kind of implicits you'll find in the program. So common usages in Scala 3 are, have actually been broken out into their own uh, things uh, that essentially make the use of implicits there uh, unnecessary. So instead of implicit classes, for instance, you have extension methods instead of uh, recursive uh, implicit instances for age lists or other type level computations. You have match types that do the same thing without implicits. And in, uh, instead of uh, essentially the whole uh, Magnolia or again shapeless, you have built in type class derivation, which uh, shapeless is still ex it does exist in Scala 3. It is one of the community built libraries, but it has shrunk a lot. It really has essentially shrunk to its core, which what is basically to make, to give the library designer powerful ways to implement the uh, type classes that are then used in type class derivation. Implicit conversions, uh, instead of having a special syntax, we have a conversion type and it's a lot tamed compared to the conversions we had before. Uh, the, the most significant taming effort was that uh, if you use one of these conversions, then the compiler will actually warn you and say, well, you get a feature warning and you say, you need to import implicit conversions. Previously, that warning happened only for the definition side where it's basically useless because, well, if I define an implicit conversion, I, I know <laughs> I, I do that intentionally, so I will not essentially pay heed to the warning. Uh, so the importance for the warning is at the use side because when I use implicit, or when the compiler inserts implicit conversions, then that might be very surprising for users. So they should be warned. And that's probably something we'll work more in the future. Uh, I believe the end goal will be that implicit conversions should be uh, unnecessary in Scala in the future. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but that's uh, a, a goal uh, to work towards too. 
Many uses of underscores, they're all gone, uh, except for two. Uh, so two uses is okay, I guess. If you use an underscore where you would define something, then it just means no name, uh, you know, it's unnamed. Uh, so for instance, a wildcard in a parameter, you could define a parameter, a, a, a wildcard in a pattern, you could define a pattern variable X, or you say, well, it's a placeholder, I don't need a variable there, I don't want to name it because I'm not gonna use it. Then you write the underscore. And if you use it in expressions or in the future types, then it means parameter. So uh, it means uh, it's something, it's, an, it's a parameter that essentially scopes over the outside of that expression. Uh, the weird data types like XML and symbols have been dropped. Uh, XML literals are still there, but uh, deprecated and will go away in the future. Uh, the unnatural syntax has been cleaned up a lot, I think, uh, with optional braces and quiet control syntax and many other things. So I believe the new syntax is really a joy to read. And early initializers have been uh, replaced by trait parameters. And there's lots and lots of other things more. So one other thing that I believe will be significant is that in the future, uh, the language is going to be very uh, a lot stricter about whether you write methods in fix or with a dot. So basically, when you declare a method, you say whether it should be written in fix or with a dot, which means that we would really standardize to normal dot syntax. Unless you write in, in, an in fix thing at the declaration, uh, everybody should write dots. And that sort of avoids the, uh, the choice paralysis and sort of the unnecessary variation that you have many, many different styles and uh, the way one person writes a Scala program is looks weird or looks strange to the way that uh, another person reads it. And before somebody says, yes, but what about optional braces? That's in my experience, not at all the case. So it's basically just like now where sometimes you can write braces around a single statement and sometimes you can leave them off. It's the same feeling. So sometimes you write them and uh, sometimes you leave them off and you can mix it. And it's just essentially it blends into the background. It doesn't really feel like two ways to do these things at all. So the challenge, I'm not saying that everything is solved already. So the challenge we are facing, I believe, is that Scala could be the simplest language in the universe and still be regarded as incredibly complex. So why is that? I think it's because libraries and presentations often do very complex and advanced stuff with it. And then the next step is that enthusiastic developers apply some of these techniques that they saw because it's cool, but sometimes for good reasons, other times because it's cool, and then they leave. And then clueless successors are left picking up the pieces. And that's essentially how you get a really, really bad reputation. Uh, 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 quite a bit the same uh, is playing out probably uh, in a bigger scale than in Scala in Haskell, where the same cycle repeats itself, advanced uh, language features, and uh, even with normal Haskell, you can, you can write advanced abstractions uh, are being pushed into libraries and then uh, there's a pushback because new people that get onboarded uh, can't make sense of it and then the managers come step in and say, well, scrap the whole thing and let's rewrite in Go. So this, we can avoid that only from a technical standpoint, if we dump down the language so that it doesn't let you do the complex stuff. And that uh, is, for Scala is not an option. So Scala is not that, is not that language. So it means that this is a persistent problem that we have to face as a community and uh, that has to be essentially tackled by the personal choices of every one of us. But there's hope because I believe that the community is increasingly embracing the principle of least power. So as exemplified, let's say, in what I call the Singapore stack. And also it's increasingly embracing Scala's unique value proposition to fuse functions and objects. So when Scala came out, I mean, in my head, it was always that essentially Scala is the language that fuses functions and objects. And there's a good reason because I believe it gives you a very uh, powerful and practical programming style. Uh, but I, it was just my head, I'm just a single guy. So uh, it turned out, well, no, no surprise in retrospect, of course, that it takes a huge effort to have a community converge on that. 
and uh, the neighboring communities of, let's say, Java or Haskell of your functional programming, uh, they have existed both for 30, 25, 30 years. So they, they have developed this culture of either pure functional programming or essentially class-based object-oriented programming for a long time. So uh, during that 25 years, people essentially uh, go, go, go to university or take other courses. Uh, they're junior programmers, they're senior programmers, they mentor others and things like that. Afterwards, you have really a culture. And when Scala came out, there was absolutely nothing. So nobody was in this space. And that's also uh, quite natural then that people sort of wanted to say, well, this language is, is cool, but I know nothing about it. Let's take it and imitate what uh, I know from others, uh, from other communities, because a lot more is published and there's a lot more learning. And that led, I think, belief to the split of uh, Scala as a better Java and Scala as Haskell on the JVM, <clears throat> where really it should be neither. It should be its own thing. It, it, I believe really it is a quite a unique value proposition, which is neither Haskell on the JVM nor a better Java. Uh, and I believe uh, gradually more and more the community is, uh, is accepting that and is embracing that and is essentially making it their thing. And so I'm actually quite hopeful that uh, we will uh, have a much more uh, uh, productive and, and influential uh, programming environment uh, over the next 10 years uh, than what we had uh, over the last 10 years. And I believe Scala 3 is intended to be a fresh start for that. So we cleared out much complexity in the language as much as we could so that libraries can shine and applications can prosper. So I still have uh, not a lot. <coughs> I'll, um, I'll have to uh, abbreviate that a little bit. So in the rest of the talk, what I wanted to do is I can't possibly do justice to all the features in Scala 3. So I'm, I thought that over the next series of talks I give, I'll do one feature each talk. And maybe uh, that feature will have uh, to, I'll have to pick up the details for the next talk because we won't have that much time anymore. So what I want to do is I want to give you a quick look at what, uh, at opaque types, opaque type aliases and what they are. I just pick out one because I think it's particularly interesting and it showcases essentially a Scala, the, the, the nature of Scala in a way which is very nice. So let me just switch to uh, the iPad and share the screen. Oops. Why does it not work? <laughs> Ah, oh, should have. No, doesn't recognize it. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. Now it comes. Sorry. This is very weird because I used this is it thing. Okay? Yeah, it's it's okay. It's a, okay. It should be should be zoom. Okay, now we're good. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> completely weird because I. I was using this thing uh, every week uh, over the past term to do remote lectures and uh, uh, somehow it has forgotten everything and starts from 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 the start. I so. see. Okay. OK, OK, so let me do that. So um, what I'm going to talk about is opaque type aliases. So uh, opaque type aliases in short, it looks like this. Uh, so we say it's uh, you write opaque type and then a name and then a right hand side. So for what this thing here would do is it would give you a new type username, which is abstract, and it's uh, represented as a string, but you know that only where you define uh, the username. Everywhere else and where you use the username, you don't do not know that it's equal to a string. So that's the, the introduction of that. So it replaces to some degree uh, value classes, even though value classes are still uh, uh, available in Scala. So uh, as an example, I want to do something that we have in Scala 3, and that's immutable arrays. So we should have had this a long time ago. Arrays are the most efficient data structure. So why do we have only the mutable form if everywhere else we emphasize immutability? 
the scalar three has immutable arrays. And if we have written immutable arrays as value classes, which we haven't done, so I'll show you the opaque types immediately afterwards, then we would have written it like this. We would have said, well, it's the class I array, it extends any val, and then uh, we give you the core functions, length and apply, but there's no update. And then we have to also essentially add you, uh, give you all the other functions, map and so on. And we have to give you a constructor in the companion object to create immutable arrays. So that's what you would do if these things were uh, valid classes. Um, so that gives you immutability. Uh, and furthermore, I arrays are represented as arrays when their type is known. So when you have a value and you write value I array, then that I array is really an array. So it does, there's no wrapper. But when you pass this IRA into a generic context, so where you, where you have a type parameter of some sort, then that IRA needs to be boxed. So there needs to be a wrapper object around the IRA. So for instance, if you write an IRA like this, and then you pass it into a list, then at that point, the list will not contain a pointer to your IRA, it will contain a pointer to an object that is essentially your wrapper that in turn points to the IRA. So you have one level of indirection in, in addition. So that's essentially the, the downside of value classes. Uh, so the question was, can we have value classes that guarantee no wrapping and no boxing ever? And that was asked originally by Eric Osweim and uh, Jorge Vincente Cantero in SIP 35. And the answer turned out to be, well, not really. Classes, classes have too much, essentially, conceived, too, too much baggage with them of things that we really associate to a class. We can't essentially uh, keep that and, uh, and do that without wrapping, not on the JVM, or not now on the JVM, I should say. But we have something that's at least as good. So what we have is opaque type aliases. And uh, that's what they look like for, for immutable arrays. So we say opaque type I array is array of A. And then you have a companion object of this opaque type. And there you now define all the methods that you have on I arrays as extension methods. So extension methods, they're written like this. So here you have a collective extension. It works on all I arrays of A, and it gives you length, apply, map, and so on. So all the methods that you have here. Uh, and you see what they do is essentially the length just says, well, it's the xs.length, the apply is that, and the map is that. So what these methods can see is that I arrays and uh, arrays are really the same thing. Because after all, uh, here, you could say, well, why would xs.length here work? Uh, and, and the answer is, well, uh, it knows that I array is an alias of array. So array has a length field. So I can call it like this. And the same thing for application. Array has an apply method, so I can call it like this. So if you write it that way, then I array always has the same representation as array. It gets never boxed and it's still immutable because we haven't gotten the update method among the, uh, the uh, extension methods that we have defined. So how does that work? Well, at some points, the compiler knows uh, that um, I array and array is the same type. And at other points, it thinks that I array is an abstract type that's different from everything else. So how is that precisely defined and implemented? Well, where does the compiler know that they are the same? It knows that they're the same in the class or object that surrounds the alias and in the opaque types companion object, if there's one. So that's the rules. Okay, so how do we implement that? So one possibility would be to say, well, the type I array and array, they're always different, but there are implicit conversions between them. And these conversions, they can be hidden using standard visibility techniques. That's basically the design of new type in Haskell, but it's not what we've done in Scala 3. Why not? Well, implicit conversions are icky. I just said we wanna get rid of them, so we're not gonna introduce new ones. And they're also hard to work here in all contexts. So for instance, uh, we also would like to know, have in, in a particular uh, context that 
a list of IRA of int is the same as a list of array of int. So do we need a separate conversion for that or can we somehow have one for all of them? It's a little bit tricky. And also Scala already has a way to use abstract types, which actually turns out is very close and we should use that. So let's have a look at how we would do the same thing with abstract types. So let's forget about all about opaque types. Can we do these things just with abstract types that we have in Scala? And the answer is yes, we could. We could have, let's say, a trait uh, API, and it would have a uh, type IRA. And that would be an abstract type. We wouldn't know what it is. And then we could have a, uh, an object, a private object, import, and that should extend API. And that would contain the alias. So in the info object, I know that IRA is an alias of plus A, but that knowledge is private. It's in this object, which nobody can access, uh, can, can see. Uh, and then we would have a public, uh, let's say, call this well uh, IRAs. That's what my IRAs module. And that is of type API and is equal to info. So here I have the abstraction. As I said, well, what everybody else will see is just the API, but I have implemented that with the others. Okay, so that's essentially that we can already already do in Scala two uh, could could do from day one. That's basically uh, where this comes from is basically the SML modules. So that's where these things have been pioneered. That's essentially the basis, the foundation of uh, of, of serious module systems. Okay. So if we put that in code, then it would look like this. So we would say, good, uh, we have this uh, API here. Uh, we have the implementation here. The API in the API, the type is abstract, and I give you extension methods that are also abstract. I don't give you an, uh, an, an implementation here, just say we have extensions. And then in the implementation, I have the actual implementations of these extension methods. And then we have essentially an object IRAs, which is uh, uh, that has the IRA API as a type and implementation as the right hand side. Okay, good. So uh, that's uh, promising, but there's still things to improve. Uh, so, for instance, um, if we do it this way, then the compiler actually doesn't know that IRA and RA are really the same because, well, here we have one implementation uh, that implements an array, IRA as an array, but I could have others. So the compiler doesn't really know that um, yeah, without a whole program analysis, that wouldn't be possible. So the compiler can't really optimize in the knowledge that uh, you say, well, you have an IRA, but I know it's really a normal array and I can optimize with that. So that's one thing. Uh, there's also quite a little, quite a lot of essentially pre-organization. I had to define the API, the implementation, the facade, and so on. Uh, can we avoid that? And uh, the surprising answer is yes, almost. It was again something that we already have, and that's self-type. So with self-types, we can split, split the internal view of an object from its external view. You, uh, so the way that works is, uh, uh, so, so uh, that, that is actually not fully correct, but to understand it's, it, it's a good way to do it that way, is to say, well, we define our object IRAs and it has an abstract type IRA. So that's essentially what everybody else sees. And it has a self type that says, the type of my this, the type of this in this object is really the type uh, a, a type that says I array of A is array of A. Ha. So that means that inside, I know uh, that uh, I array of A is the same as array of A, but outside I don't. To the um, uh, I don't have access to the uh, to, to, to the uh, to the equality. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, what that means is that we, uh, well, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, let me just skip. Uh, uh, yeah, so the reason why this is so is that if we look at the latest equality here, then what this really says is that's just an abbreviation for this one here. So if you talk inside the object IRAs about IRA of A, then it's really this dot IRA of A. And that, that way we get the type of this here and the type of this says, well, IRA of A is the same as A, as array of A, and that's how I get it. So that's the trick. Okay, so uh, do we need opaque type analysis at all, or could the programmer apply the self type type technique uh, herself? After all, I've shown you how to do it. Uh, so, so maybe there's no need for it. Well, actually, it's not quite that simple uh, because objects cannot have self-types. They have uh, essentially, their self-type is just essentially a singleton type to the object value. And also, a at least if, as long as a class is concrete, so not abstract, it has to conform to the declared self-type. And <coughs> in that construction, it wouldn't work because the declared self-type says it's an alias and the actual value in the class just says it's it's an abstract type. So we need a little metric, but it, we really we really need only a tiny amount, not much at all. So that's quite interesting. Okay, uh, I'll skip that with the bounds because we're out of time. So that's another interesting thing. So a question here is, well, how niche is that really? And the beautiful thing is that in fact, it's pretty central. So as you know, the uh, foundations of Scala that we've developed and that essentially Scala tree is built on is uh, the dot calculus. So the dot calculus is essentially a tiny programming language that we can study fully and prove uh, sound in the meta theory. And here it is. So that's essentially all we have in the dot calculus. So I'm gonna uh, skip that and essentially go directly to uh, things that we have in in the uh, Scala, so essentially the Greek of the dot calculus that you see here uh, uh, corresponds to these things in Scala. So you have essentially functions, uh, including dependent functions. Uh, oops. You have objects, uh, method definitions, types, and so on. And if you look at the types, then uh, the interesting thing is you have type declarations for abstract types with bounds. You have intersections um, and um, uh, you have, um, uh, ah, sorry, no, now I have to go back to the Greek because the slide doesn't have it. Uh, and, and, and you have these self types. So that's essentially in the Greek an object. So it says the X, that's the this. The T here is the type of the this, and then it has a bunch of definitions. So what you see here is you have the self types, you have the intersection, and you have the uh, the, uh, the abstract types, uh, which is essentially this thing here in the Greek. And with these three things, you build opaque types. So you could say opaque types is really a natural outgrowth of what we have at the very, very core of Scala. Okay, uh, so uh, one question is, well, uh, now we have opaque types in valid classes, which one should we prefer? So uh, I believe there are some benefits to valid classes. Uh, ToString works. So ToString can be customized for a value class as opposed to the type it wraps. Parallel matching works. And there's no boxing as long as the type is unknown. Is known, sorry. Uh, the big advantage of opaque types is no boxing ever and essentially stronger abstraction. So if you care about parametricity, then also opaque types give you that, but value classes, uh, not really. So I believe in the future, conceptually value classes, they're essentially just wrappers around their elements and the wrappers happen to be unboxed, but there's still a type in the wrapper. The, the wrapper gives you the runtime type and makes sure two string and pattern matching work. But unboxed wrappers don't exist on the JVM today. So we, with value classes, we apply a trick that we said for monomorphic occurrences where the type is precisely known of classes with a single element, we can avoid the wrapper. We know everything. We know the type. Uh, we, we can essentially uh, uh, generate code to do everything explicitly. 
But as soon as we pass into a generic context, we need to box, and that's the price. So once the JVM gets net, essentially native value classes, with, there's a project that tries to do that for a long time already called Valhalla, then we'll be able to support multi-element value classes as simple unboxed wrappers. It will still be a wrapper, there will be an, an additional field that uh, contains the type of a value class, but that wrapper will no longer have to be live on the heap, will no longer have to be boxed. So in that future, opaque type aliases and value classes have clearly different paths. So uh, opaque, an opaque type alias is an alias that is essentially abstract. Uh, you don't know what it is in most of your programs and value classes are essentially a general uh, form of wrapper. Oops. So credits, um, the opaque type design, I found it very exciting because it was the result of a collective journey of discovery. Nobody would have thought initially that we would end up with that. And I believe what we ended up with it is actually really elegant and beautiful. So uh, credit goes to uh, Eric Os Osheim and Jorge uh, Cantero for having proposed the use cases in ZIP35. Then Adrian Morris had this idea with the self types. Uh, Guillaume Mach has proposed to generalize the transparent scope to the enclosing class, so that's the current design. And Lionel Paro has, uh, was the first to have proposed bounds for opaque types, which is something that we skipped. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you for staying with me. And 